most of lucky charms. They're magically delicious. And he says, he, uh, he says to me, and I asked you a football question. You didn't know what I was talking about because you're football ignorant, so you got mad. 0-6. Oh, All you did was cry for three minutes and make a bunch of personal in insults, shaking my head. And then he says, WWJD, which is, of course, what would Jesus do? I don't like you because of football. He's like, I don't care if you don't like me. We aren't friends, sir, and are you a 12-year-old girl? Stop acting like one. And then he says to me, he says to me, you blocked me after UGA whipped that ass and it's happening again week four. And then he says to me, obnoxious is spending 15 minutes on your live stream crying about Uncle Lou. And I'm like, really? Really? <laughs> this guy's out of his mind. You know, obviously a guy like this, you can't argue with him because uh, I think there's something seriously brain dead with this guy. And then he says to me, I'm football ignorant. That's that's a good Big Mac. I like that. He 0-6, 0-6, 0-6, which he thinks I don't know what that means, which I, of course I do. It's Notre Dame's record in BCS slash uh, playoff games. Yeah, Uncle Flu. Oh, he showed up, um, like I said, a few months ago, he showed up on a live stream. I thought I had him blocked, but uh, apparently not. Um, but uh, just man to man, I sent him a private message uh, asking him, like, look, dude, this is getting old. Just stop. Please leave me alone. Here's the here's the the here's the uh, the back and forth of that. So the first thing I first I first say to him, um, I don't know how you got on the live stream. Just leave me the hell alone. I don't know what your problem is, but I haven't even been talking about you or giving you a thought. So just stay away. That's all I say to him. Then he just sends me a, a picture of a snowflake and basically just sends me meme after meme of uh, like piss off and more or less words. And then he says, uh, like, well, let's see, about four or five times here. One, two, three, four. Yeah, five times. Five times he says to me, oh, and six. Oh, and six. Oh, and six. Which he thinks I don't know what that means, which I, of course I do. It's Notre Dame's record in BCS slash uh, playoff games. I haven't given you a thought in four years, and you keep starting crap with me. And he says to me, I didn't start anything, sir. I asked you to explain 0 and 6. You got mad because you don't know what 0 for 6 means, because you don't know shit about football. This is all about football, which is why I, I blocked him off my channel. And then he says to me, leave you alone. You messaged me, nitwit. I'm like, well, yeah, I messaged him because, I, like I said, I thought I could talk to an adult, though. And he mentions 0 for 6 again. And he says, to, he, uh, he says to me, and I asked you a football question. You didn't know what I was talking about because you're football ignorant, so you got mad. 0-6. Oh, All you did was cry for three minutes and make a bunch of personal in insults, shaking my head. And then he says, WWJD, which is, of course, what would Jesus do? And I said to him, I don't like you because of football. channel. Respect. Back with another 2019 college football preview and prediction today. We're doing a whole series of these videos leading up to the start of the season, which this year is August 24th. Uh, quote unquote week zero, right? Uh, the Miami versus Florida game, main game that week. We've done nine or 10 of these. I'll put a playlist up here. If I can remember, you can click that link. It'll take you to the list of all the preview and predictions we've done so far. And we're going to do a whole bunch more of these, like I said, leading up to the start of the college football season. Done a few teams from each of the five conferences, major conferences so far up today. Someone that refuses to join a conference. We'll get into, the, we'll get into that. Notre Dame.
Hey, good morning. It's Uncle Lou here. Yeah, that's right. It's me, Uncle Lou, and I'm live for you on YouTube today. Thanks for watching. Everybody's favorite team to talk about, isn't it? Notre Dame. I tell, I, I'll say one thing about Notre Dame. Uh, whether you hate them or love them, doesn't matter where they're ranked in the preseason. Doesn't matter how they do during the season. Doesn't matter where they're ranked when the season ends. Doesn't matter what bowl game they're in. Every college football fan, or most anyway, always have an opinion, good or bad, one way or the other, on Notre Dame. One of the most talked about college football teams in all of college football year in and year out. Of course, you got lifelong Notre Dame fans. They love Notre Dame. They love to remind you that historically, Notre Dame is one of the biggest and most important college football programs in history. And they're right. Uh, when you look at the life of college football, Notre Dame uh, is weaved in and out of there from the beginning till now. So they have that going for them. Newt Rockney, Rudy. Uh, yep, Manti Payow. Uh, his girlfriend is right here. Say, uh, say hello to the people. Hello. Uh, yeah, not a bad looking girl. Uh, it, uh, you know, uh, made a couple of national title games over the last six or seven years. We're going to get into that too. Brian Kelly, head coach. We'll talk about, uh, we're going to talk about all, all that. Uh, so you got the people that love them. They love to remind you about all that. Then you got the people that really hate Notre Dame and they have some legitimate reasons too, right? Uh, some of them hate Notre Dame because of the NBC TV contract from 30 years ago, right? Which doesn't seem like a big deal now. And if you're under 30, you, you, you may not know why that's a big deal, but 30 years ago, Every game wasn't on TV like it is now. And a lot of games were only televised regionally. So like I live in Georgia. So I got to see a lot of Georgia and Alabama and South Carolina and, and Clemson and Tennessee and SEC games and some of the ACC games that are that schools are located near here. I didn't get to see very many Big Ten games, Big 12 games, Pac-12 games. I didn't get to see a lot of that. A lot of Now, the major ones would come on ABC, NBC, CBS, something like that. Michigan, Ohio State, that would come on, Texas, Oklahoma. But it wasn't like it is today where you, you have, you know, you got 45 games on at noon. They're all on TV somewhere. You can find it. It wasn't like that back then. And Notre Dame signed a TV contract with NBC. And every single Notre Dame game was on TV, on NBC, every single week, every single year. And they were the only team that had that luxury. And that rubbed people the wrong way. And I think that's kind of silly. It's not Notre Dame's fault that uh, they were able to secure that deal with NBC. It was actually a forward thinking on Notre Dame's part. Fast forward till today. And every single team and every single conference has TV deals, right? Notre Dame was really the first to do it, at least on a national scale like that. So I don't, I, I don't really understand the hate for that. Now, some people claim Notre Dame bias. I'm not so sure about that either. They won't join a conference. Now, I agree with this here. It's ridiculous. 2019, get it in a conference. And what makes it worse is Notre Dame trying to play both sides of the fence, right? They're trying to have each one of their feet dipped in two separate pools. They want to be in the ACC for basketball, but they want to keep the ACC at arm's distance for football. Why? Ask yourself why. The answers are pretty obvious. Uh, and actually, uh, the ACC should be ashamed of themselves, too. The ACC should not allow this either. Uh, the ACC should tell them, you're either going to be in or you're going to be out. You're not going to be in in the sports that you choose to be in, but then not in in the biggest, most major sport in all of college athletics, football. So I, I, give, I give the ACC some of the blame for this, too. But to play five ACC teams a year, before that deal was worked out, they played a handful of Big Ten teams every year. That was the conference they should have joined, right? Would have made sense geographically. They're located in the Midwest, whether they're in Indiana, something like that. Yeah. Uh, you know, you got Michigan, Ohio State, Michigan State, Northwestern, Purdue, uh, Indiana. You know, so that would have made sense, but they don't want to do it. Why? Uh, they feel there's no benefit to them to do it. And so far, they've been proven right. Right? Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, they had a good season in 2012. They made the uh, BCS title game. They weren't punished for not playing a 13th game. They weren't punished for not playing a conference championship game or winning a conference. Last year, 2018, they go 12-0, they get in. They weren't punished for not playing a 13th game. They weren't punished for not uh, risking a loss in a conference championship game or playing for a conference championship game, and they got into the playoffs. So, so far, their decision to not join a conference, in my opinion, has not hurt them. And I don't think they're going to join a conference until it does. Now, what would that look like? What if Notre Dame were to go to 11-1 and one, one year uh, and get left out of a four-team playoff? I think that may be enough to make them reconsider. Now, the issue is that's not likely to happen. Not that I don't think Notre Dame can go 11-1, and one, but uh, everything would have to align right for that to, to happen in terms of them being 11-1 and one and getting left out. When, when they have a, a legitimate argument to make to get in, right? It's going to depend on how many losses other conference champions have and things like that. Plus, we all know the playoffs are expanding in 2025. And at that point, 
uh, this conversation will be moot, right? Because I do believe Notre Dame would get into an 18 playoff at 11 and 1, even if they're not in a conference, not playing a conference championship game. I don't think they would get in right now at 11 and 1. I think if they went 11 and 1 right now, they would get punished for not playing a 13th game and get left out. I think they would be on the outside looking in. Well, we'll see. Anyway, that's not really the point of this. I could make a whole video on the playoffs and Notre Dame and how that fits in. That's not really the point here. We're previewing Notre Dame's 2019 season. Let's go. All right, how did they do last year? 12-0. and 0. Uh, We all know. We all remember. It wasn't that long ago. 12-0. and 0, Made the playoffs right before getting completely housed by Clemson. 30-3. to 3. Continuing a trend that dates all the way back to the late 80s, which I'll talk about here in just a minute. What were Notre Dame's big wins last year? I'll say this about Notre Dame. Was the schedule that tough last year? Probably not. Hard to blame that on Notre Dame, though. Their schedule looked hard at the beginning of the season, right? Not Notre Dame's fault that several of the teams they had scheduled last year had historically, I mean, epically bad seasons, right? They had Florida State and Southern Cal on the schedule last year. Both five-win teams last year. I wonder how far in time you would have to go back to find a season where Southern Cal and Florida State each won five or less games in a season. You would have to go back a long way, I'm sure. Maybe one of my loyal viewers and typer trolls will look that up for us and let us know in the comments section. Can you? How long, how long ago, when Florida State and Southern Cal were both that bad, five or less wins? Let us know in the comments section. Virginia Tech was on a schedule. They were a terrible team. Uh, I mean, when you so when you start looking at Notre Dame, Notre Dame still had some good wins, right? They ended up beating three ranked teams. They beat Michigan week one. Michigan ended the season ranked 14. Michigan is another polarizing team. Some of you think they're no good. I happen to think they're pretty good. Uh, but no matter what you think, uh, <coughs> huh? sorry, uh, they were a 10-win team, right? What were they, 10-3? and three? Something like that, losing to Notre Dame, Ohio State, and then a bowl game of 10-3. and three. Uh, They beat Northwestern. Northwestern finished the season 21st. Northwestern's not a very good team. They're a product of a mediocre division, let's just be real. And they beat Syracuse. They destroyed Syracuse, actually, who finished the season 15th. But again, another 10-win team here, Syracuse. But again, a terrible... The ACC's just got awful. 10 wins in the ACC is not all that impressive, to be honest. It's just not. The ACC was epically bad last year. Uh, so, But those still were three pretty good wins, right? So you ran the table 12-0. Uh, and, and then, you, you know, Clemson, of course, did what they did in the first round of the playoffs. And we'll talk more about that, like I mentioned in a second. Here's the ending screen of last year's Notre Dame preview and prediction video that I made. So we can we can see sort of how I did last year. I had you at nine and three. Obviously, I was way off. Uh, you were 12 and 0. So I was wrong. But let's be real here. I had you losing to Michigan. That was one of your toughest games of the year. You won you won by one touchdown, 24 to 17 at home in a game that could have gone either way. I know you changed quarterbacks later and, and, and you would have beat Michigan by 150, 110 points if Ian Book would have played. Believe me, I've seen the comments, but that's not the point. I had you losing to Virginia Tech. I think that was a road game, and that's why I picked that as a loss. I didn't necessarily think Virginia Tech was going to be better than Notre Dame, just a tough spot on the road, but Virginia Tech was epically bad last year. They lost to uh I mean they lost to, they lost to a division two uh, two team. I'm drawing a blank on the name now. Again, someone will put it in the comments section. They lost I mean they they were just terrible. And then I had you losing to Southern Cal, who, again, was had a historically bad season. Um, so I don't think my pro projection of last year of 9-3 and three was necessarily that bad of a projection. I think, I think Notre Dame ended up being a little bit better than most people thought they would be. And then I think they benefited from two of these three teams completely falling off the map uh, last year, which no one saw coming. But in any case, uh, I had you at 9-3. and three, You went 12-0. and 0, There you go. Let's talk about this loss to Clemson. Clemson was an amazing team last year. Very hot at the end of the year. Destroyed Alabama 44-16. They would have beat anybody they played. They were just on fire last year. So we give you a mulligan for that one. But that's not the issue. You've got to go back 30 years to find a big postseason win for Notre Dame. And that's not even the worst part. Well, let me just go here. Here's, here's the thing. The BCS was started in 1992, okay? From the start of the BCS till now, Notre Dame has appeared in eight either BCS title games, BCS bowl games, New Year's Six bowl games, or playoff games. Eight times that has happened since 1992 for Notre Dame. You're 0-8. And, 
every single Sugar Bowl, Fiesta Bowl, Orange Bowl, Rose Bowl, title game, playoff game, Notre Dame has appeared in since, 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 since it started in 1992. Winless. 0-8. I'm go and look at the scores here. I'm going to run through this. Last year, first round, playoff game, loss, Clemson, 30-3. 2015, Fiesta Bowl, loss, Ohio State, 44-28. to 2012, BCS National Title Game, loss, Alabama, 42-14. to 2006, Sugar Bowl, loss, LSU, 41-14. to 2000, Fiesta Bowl, loss, Oregon State, 41 to 9. 1995, Orange Bowl, loss, Florida State, 31 to 26. Congrats for keeping that one less than one score. The rest are blowouts. 1994, Fiesta Bowl, loss, Colorado, 41 to 24. That's eight times Notre Dame has made major bowl games since the start of the BCS era in 1992. And in those eight games, they're 0-8. And, and here's the margin of loss in each of those games, from the most recent loss to Clemson all the way back to this 94 Fiesta Bowl loss. You lost by 27. You lost by 16. You lost by 28. You lost by 27. You lost by 14. You lost by 32. You lost by 5. And you lost by 27. That's an average of 23 points per game that Notre Dame has lost when some committee or computer system or whatever has placed them in a big time uh, bowl game against an equally big time team for that particular year. Eight games, eight losses, seven of the eight were blowouts. You have lost those eight games by an average of 23 points per game. This is why people say Notre Dame is overrated every single year. This is why people say Notre Dame needs to join a conference. This is why people say Notre Dame doesn't belong when they got in the playoffs last year, even though they were 12-0, and or when they got to the BCS title game in 2012 and got absolutely ran out of the building. This is why. Uh, and this is hard to defend. The last time Notre Dame won a major bowl game to end a uh, season was back in 1988-89, uh, their last national championship. This is pitiful. This is embarrassing. Uh, it's hard to it's hard to justify this. I, I mean, people call up and talk about these losses. I, I just have to agree with them. I, I, when is Notre Dame going to prove people wrong with some of these games? This is pitiful. Anyway, let's talk about your team uh, now instead of beating a dead horse here, the fact that you can't win a big game in the last 30 years. Back-to-back 10-win -back seasons for Brian Kelly at Notre Dame. This is the first time this has happened at Notre Dame since the Lou Holtz era. Uh, no back-to-back 10-win -back seasons for Notre Dame until 17 and 18. Uh, you got to go all the way back to Lou Holtz to find the last two years. They won 10-plus games in back-to-back -back years. And I think Brian Kelly's won 10-plus games three of the last four years. So on a pretty good run there. Offense last year, really, really good. In the last nine games of the year, which is where Ian Book started playing, you averaged 37.2 points per game. That's really, really good. Uh, and, of course, Ian Book comes back. You get four offensive linemen back. Uh, 306 yards passing per game by Ian Book last year after he took over uh, in week four, right? Now, your running back situation, you lose Dexter Williams. I think he was your best running back, home run hitter type of guy. I, I think he was the best you had. You've moved a wide receiver, Jafar Armstrong, to uh, running back, and everything I read says he looks pretty good there. We'll see. Um, an, an, an athletic guy. Uh, you still have, uh, what is this guy's Tony Jones Jr. or Troy jo Tony Jones Jr., I think it is. Wide receiver, again, you lose probably your best wide receiver in Miles Boykin. You do get uh, Chase, uh, uh, this Chase, what's his name, Claypool, Claypool, whatever his name is, you get him back. Uh, you got a former walk-on, probably going to start in the slot, but this guy's pretty good. Uh, I mean, sometimes walk-ons, walk they just don't get noticed in high school for whatever reason, and they end up being pretty good at the college level, and that's the case uh, with this guy you have at the slot. Uh, and you've got four really good uh, sophomore wide receivers that are going to be in their second year this year. They didn't play a whole lot last year. I would think at least one or two of those four is going to end up being pretty good because Notre Dame has recruited at a pretty good level. And some of those guys are going to have to see some, some playing time this year, and we'll see. 
Now on defense, you lose some major pieces on your defense. One of the best defensive backs you've ever had, Julian Love. Of course, he's gone. Uh, Trilly on the defensive line, Tranquil at linebacker, Coney at linebacker. I already mentioned Julian Love. You're going to have to find a way to replace some of those people. I'm not so sure Notre Dame's defense can be as good in 19 as it was in 18. It's not going to be bad. It's going to be a good defense. It's not going to be bad at all. Um, I, I question whether it can be as good as last year, though. We'll see. You've got a lot of talent here, but you're replacing a lot of experience. So a lot of, the, a lot of that talent on your team right now is young and inexperienced. We'll see how that pans out over the course of the year. But Notre Dame's going to have another really, really good team, especially on offense. I think you'll probably be better on offense this year than you were last year, year two with Ian Book. Plenty of weapons at wide receiver. Um, if you're a Notre Dame fan, you'd like one of these running backs to sort of become the go-to guy, and we'll see if that happens. Um, but anyway, let's try to figure out what Notre Dame's records are going to be this year. I'll put the schedule up on the screen. You guys know how we do this. I'm going to go through it game by game, give you a winner and a loser for every single one, try to come up with a final regular season record for Notre Dame. Can they repeat? their success from last year and make a return trip to the playoffs. Let's find out. Uh, boy, this is terrible here, week one. Not just uh, for everybody. They give us one game on Labor Day every year, right? Week one of college football season. Well, you have your week zero. There'll be three or four games that day capped off with Miami, Florida. But then Thursday of that next week is really when college football season actually starts, where all the teams play that weekend, right? Clemson and Georgia Tech play that Thursday, a bunch of other teams too. And then you got games Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. They always give us that one Labor Day night game, Labor Day night, Monday night. Notre Dame at Louisville. Jesus, what a boring game this will be. Louisville is one of the worst teams in America last year. Wholesale changes on the coaching staff. And unfortunately, if you're a Louisville fan, it wasn't just a coaching issue last year. It was a serious la uh, lack of talent issue, too, and that's not going to be fixed in one year. Louisville would not be a good team this year. This will be a boring game. Notre Dame, you will absolutely roll. You'll start off 1-0. and Then week two, you come uh, home, your first home game of the year. I was about to say this was a non-conference game, but let's keep it real. They're all non-con games for Notre Dame because they won't join the conference. New Mexico win. I mean, come on, give me a break. Uh, week three. This is where the wheels start to come off for Notre Dame. Uh, yes, I'm a Georgia fan. Cry about it in the comments section. I don't know what else to tell you. Notre Dame is a borderline top 10 team, uh, in my opinion. If you look at any preseason poll that's out, uh, you'll see that. Uh, they're, they're 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, depending on where you look. UGA is ranked third in almost every single preseason poll. Obviously, that doesn't, that's, you know, you, you can't go by just that. That's not what I'm saying. UGA will be favored. It's at UGA. You've never beat UGA. Uh, we're undefeated against you. Uh, we beat you two seasons ago in your house, which we turned into our house. Let's just be real. That place was 65 70% Georgia fans. Embarrassing. Went up there and beat you. Jake Fromm, still the quarterback at Georgia. That was his first ever career start at Georgia. Easton had got hurt week one, the game before we played Notre Dame. We go up there. It was a close game. It was a good game. Uh, but, of course, we had to go ahead and, and get that dub. And it's going to happen again this year. I just don't think you're going on the road beating Georgia. Georgia hasn't lost a home game in two and a half years. I don't see it happening week three. I give you a loss there. You're sitting at two and one. After that, you get a couple of home games here. Looks like three home games. Virginia, Bowling Green, and Southern Cal. Uh, I don't see any way possible you go any worse than two and one there. Bowling Green, forget it. That's a win. I do think Virginia's a good team, but for the ACC, which you're halfway a part of, I like Virginia's quarterback, that Bryce Perkins. Might be the second best quarterback in the ACC behind T-Law, Trevor Lawrence. Uh, you get all three of these at home, though. I think you find a way to win all three. Southern Cal, I'm not a believer in, in, in Clay Helton. He's in over his head out there. Him and Willie Taggart, I don't know how they have coaching jobs at major universities, but somehow they do. Uh, but I think you find a way to get it done here and win all three of these games. It wouldn't surprise me if either the Virginia game or the Southern Cal game ends up being close. Southern Cal's got a ton of talent. They, they may be the most talented team you play other than UGA in terms of just total roster talent. Michigan maybe too. <sighs> Five and seven last year, though. Clay Helton's got to get it turned around in a hurry. I don't think they can beat y'all in your house. I'm going to give you wins in all three of those there. And that takes you into a bye week. I, I, I skipped your first bye week. You have a bye week after week one which is not a good place to have it. You like to play three or four games and get your bye week. But lucky you got two this year. Not a change in college football. Every team has two bye weeks this year. Uh, in order to get the season to start when they want it to and end when they want it to, it's an extra Saturday in there. So they gave every team an extra uh, bye week. 
So you get your bye week, come out of that, uh, you get your second tough game, really, uh, road game of the year on the road at Michigan. I talked about this a little bit earlier. One of your best games last year, or, or well, uh, one of your toughest games last year. I, we know you didn't have Ian, Ian Book. You don't have to remind us in the comment section. But Michigan's going to be a good team again this year. you got to play them there on the road in the big house. Um, this is one of those games. This game should be played every year, right? They never should have quit playing it. This is just one of those games. College football season doesn't seem right. You don't get to see Notre Dame, Michigan. I, I think Michigan beats you. Now, admittedly, I'm way higher on Michigan than the average college football fan is this year. I'll admit that. So would I be shocked if you went into Michigan and won a close game? No, I would not be shocked at all. Um, but I'm, I, I have to stay consistent. I've been high on Michigan all offseason, all preseason. High on them still now. I got to stay consistent here. I think you go on the road to Ann Arbor and get your second loss of the season, losing to Michigan. Uh, then you come back home, play Virginia Tech. I have no idea what we're going to get from Virginia Tech this year. I like their coach. I like some of the uh, some of their roster, but they were absolutely pitiful last year. It's hard to explain. I I, I don't I don't know what we're going to get here out of Virginia Tech. Now we'll know by the time this game is played because this comes a little past the midway point of the season. You get them at home, so I'm pretty comfortable giving you a win here. I think you're a better team than Virginia Tech. Um, and, and since I just have so many question marks about Virginia Tech in general, I'm just going to go ahead and give you a win there. And then you go on the road at Duke. They overachieved last year, in my opinion, with a first-round NFL quarterback in Daniel Jones with New York Giants now. They don't have the recruiting and the depth to replace elite players like that, and they weren't that good of a team last year with Daniel Jones. I can't see you losing to Duke. It's on the road, yeah, but home field advantage at Duke? No, uh, not unless you're playing in their basketball arena. Uh, I give you a win at Duke. A couple of home games, Navy and Boston College. Uh, Navy, they get a win once a year you don't see coming or at least play a couple of close games you don't see coming. Tricky to play them because of the style of, of offense they run, but I, I just can't see, no, I can't see Navy winning. I'm going to give you a win against Navy. Boston College, you get them at home, too. Again, they're one of those ACC teams, Boston College, Maryland, Pitt, uh, Syracuse, NC State. It put those teams in a hat, shake it up, pull one out. They're all the same team with, with different helmets on. That's it. Uh, I'll give you two wins there, Navy and Boston College. And in the last game of the year, I think could be interesting. Some people have Stanford as like a dark horse, uh, a, a dark horse to win the uh, Pac-12 this year. I don't see that. I do like their quarterback, uh, K.J. Costello, and I think David Shaw is one of the most underrated coaches in America, period, hands down, and bar none. However, they, un they were unimpressive last year. They really let me down uh, ba based off what I thought they were going to do last year. I do think they'll be better. I mean, what were they, 8-5 and five last year? And that was a down year for them. I mean, that's, that's the point David Shaw really has gotten Stanford to. People expect 10-plus wins a year out there and compete for the Pac-12 title. Eight and five was a down year. Uh, that's a compliment. It, it, when eight and five is your down years, uh, you've developed a pretty good program, and that's what David Shaw has done. You got to play him there. I do think you could potentially lose that game. Um, I think that will be a close game. And honestly, that was probably the hardest one for me to pick on this list here. But I gave you a win. Now, that puts you at 10 and two. I'm pretty confident that Notre Dame is going to go 10 and two. I'm not as confident on the Michigan and Stanford game, depending on what happens. If I'm totally wrong about Michigan and they're a train wreck again with half an offense that can't get first downs and, you know, you could easily beat Michigan and then maybe you lose to Stanford. I don't know. So I'm, de you know, 10 and two, it is what it is. I have to pick the losses. Um, I, I, I'm very confident in the Georgia, uh, in, in the Georgia game. I actually think Georgia probably wins that game by two or three scores. I don't think it'll be that close. Um, but uh, yeah, so 10 and two, you lose a close one to Michigan. You win a close one at the end of the year to Stanford. You finish at 10-2. and two. Uh, The bad news is 10-2, and two, that's not going to get you in the playoffs if you're Notre Dame. Now, if you had a 13th game, let's say Notre Dame was in the ACC, right, and went 10-2 and two, and then showed up in the ACC title game and beat a 12-0 Clemson. Guess what, Notre Dame? You'd be in the playoffs. Be in the playoffs. <sighs> but you don't need that aggravation of playing a 13th game, so you're not in the playoffs. You'll finish 10-2. and two. You'll go on to play in a New Year's Six Bowl where, guess what? Uh, different verse, same as the first. You'll get absolutely destroyed. Have a good morning. <laughs>